welcome to, to you all this afternoon. Um, it's good to see you all. Whether we are gathered here at Lidget Park or across our circuit or indeed much further away, welcome. It's really good to be with you. For those of you gathered here, there is an opportunity after worship to have a takeaway coffee and chat and drink in the garden. It will be served in the community room and obviously if we can all queue in a socially distanced way and then take our drinks out into the garden. We are here to give thanks for the years of committed service and ministry of Reverend Robert Creamer and to say farewell to him and Pat as they leave Yorkshire and travel across the Pennines as they begin their next phase in their life's journey. Let us be still and gather our thoughts as we come before God. North, South, East, West, wherever we go, wherever we are, the Lord is near. Night, day, morning, noon, whatever the time, whatever the season, the Lord is near. Darkness, light, joy, despair. Whatever the day, whatever the moment, the Lord is near. Near to help, near to care. Near to shelter, near to comfort. Praise the Lord who is with us. We sing together, yes, we sing. Um, we sing behind our masks and let's sing clearly so that those online can really hear our voices. So we sing from hymn, Hymns and Psalms, number 45, The Great Love of God. service to know that the hymns and the readings from scripture have been chosen by Robert and I think with Pat's assistance perhaps and they have special resonance and meaning from the years of Robert's ministry. We've already heard sections from Isaiah in the call to worship and I'm going to be using a piece of Isaiah 55 
to lead us into our opening prayer. During the opening prayers, I'm going to ask you to do something physical. I like when I'm watching things on screen to be reminded that I'm really there and bodily present. So those of you online can do this as well, hopefully. And those in the building, I think you've probably got enough room being spread out like this. There are three simple actions as I pray. The first is going to be holding our hands out in front of us, receiving from God. And the first part of the prayer is about receiving from God. And then the middle section of the prayer, and I'll indicate when to change, is about Jesus Christ, our Saviour. And I'm going to invite you just to hold your hands out as a cross and remember the way that God gave his Son for us. And then the final part of the prayer is offering ourselves in praise to God. So I'm going to invite you just to put your hands up. It's a little bit of exercise for the opening prayer. We begin, though, with verses from Isaiah chapter 55. Ho, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And you that have no money, come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread, and your labour for that which does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me, and eat what is good, and delight yourselves in rich food. Let us pray. We hold our hands before us. Gracious and merciful God, Thank you for the abundant provision you make for us in creation, for the goodness and fullness of nature. We fill our bodies with rich food and sweet drinks, yet we still hunger and thirst for more. We thirst for you. We move our hands to the shape of a cross, and so we praise you for taking the initiative to replenish and renew our lives. You established a new and everlasting covenant of grace in the person of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Saviour. Through him we seek you and find you, O God. Through him we call on you and know that we are heard. And so we raise our hands in praise. For through him, the distance between your thoughts and our thoughts, your ways and our ways, is spanned by your divine love. We praise and adore you, O God, as we offer our worship and our prayers through Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Saviour. Amen. Amen. We're going to now hear the scripture readings for our service, which are going to be read by two of our circuit stewards, by Andy and then by Matt. from John chapter 15, the first 11 verses. I am the true vine, and my father is the vine grower. He removes every branch in me that bears no fruit. Every branch that bears fruit, he prunes to make it bear more fruit. You have already been cleansed by the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me as I abide in you. Just as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who abide in me and I in them bear much fruit, because apart from me you can do nothing. Whoever does not abide in me is thrown away like a branch and withers. Such branches are gathered thrown into the fire and burn. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask for whatever you wish and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit and become my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. 
you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. I have said these things to you, so that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be complete. Thanks be to God. The second reading is from Romans chapter 12, verses 1 to 12. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds, so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of yourself more highly than you ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and not all the members have the same function. So we, who are many, are one body in Christ, and individually we are members one of another. We have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us. Prophecy in proportion to faith. Ministry in ministry. The teacher in teaching. The exhorter in exhortation. The giver in generosity. The leader in diligence. The compassionate in cheerfulness. Let love be genuine. Hate what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with mutual affection. Outdo one another in showing honour. Do not lack to zeal. Be ardent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. And be patient in suffering. Persevere in prayer. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you very much for reading for us. In a few minutes, our preacher for the service will be Susan Howell, and we look forward to her leading our reflections on Robert's ministry and retirement in the light of those scriptures. But, but first, we're going to sing again. One of the musical features of Robert's ministry in this circuit has been the assistance of Concordia, our singing group, and they have very kindly recorded two special uh, songs for this service, which we're going to enjoy now. And they're going to lead us from the screen, from video. Please again join in here and as well at, online at home. We're going to hear, first of all, sing along to Sing of the Lord's Goodness and then Teach Me to Dance. So in the building, I invite you to stand. Thank you. 
This is what life's all about. A comment to the media from a youngster in Leeds last Monday morning, having finally been able to go into a nightclub after midnight on Sunday night. Teach me to dance. Well, this Sunday we have something in these readings about what life's all about for Robert and Pat, who chose them. And one particular verse stands out for him in the version he first knew it. Let hope keep you joyful, in trouble stand firm, persist in prayer. And I'll weave in that theme, but you're not having a three-point sermon. <laughs> Robert, as you join the ranks of ministers who are sitting down in the congregation more often, you may find yourself occasionally thinking to yourself what you might have wanted to say about the readings if you were in the pulpit. A necessary discipline, which I know my father and grandfather, both predecessors of yours at Hartley Victoria College, had to learn in retirement. My grandfather, a kindly man, if he could find nothing else positive to say about a sermon, would say, well, it was a good text. <laughs> so you can at least say that on this occasion as you chose them. And to the rest of you, I would just remind you that, as they say, other services are available. Do watch Robert's own fine parting address to us all about story, gift and response in last Sunday's circuit service on YouTube. Robert, you asked me to preach, not do a eulogy. And of course, I'm not here to preach solely to you, still less at you, but to proclaim good news to those who are near and to those who are far off. And in these readings, so much good news. And for me, there's so much about connectedness, something which for good or ill is so much part of our lives today whether we think of our corporate awareness and responsibility about climate change or the devastating effects of the global pandemic or the wonder of technology connecting us. I think, Robert, you'd never have envisaged at the outset of your active ministry that this would be the world in which you moved to the next phase of your ministry. Robert, you and Pat have, of course, offered a connectedness in your life with family and friendships and in ministry for which we thank God. Um, and in this part of Leeds, 29 years. Not quite Lord Soper in London, but quite a lot. Sort of test match length, not 100 ball cricket. And Pat, well, you're not alone. Pat, as those who have found yourself for more years in Leeds than expected in response to your partner's calling. But together you've been part of something much more, connected to, sharing with all God's people in God's mission. As our readings are all about, in John, how we're connected in the vine to Christ, and in Romans, connected to each other in the body, Christ's body. John's Gospel first, as we abide, remain connected to Christ and in Christ, that leads on to that wonderful image of what it produces, fruitfulness. Now, whenever we reflect on our own, or more importantly, on other people's Christian life and ministry, it's always a difficult balance, isn't it? There are the times when we feel that what we've done has borne fruit, and the other times where we may never know in this life, but have to trust to God's loving providence. Yes, there are the times when what we've said and done have borne fruit that we can see and rejoice in. And we rejoice with you, Robert, in those times. All that your years of faithful connectional, spelt the other way, connectional ministry have achieved the work among university students and those being formed in ministry, your work for the unity of Christ's church and for the life of this district, the hard slog of amalgamating, connecting circuits, 
And those times of worship which have brought a word of comfort or challenge and the stories you've heard and become part of. Fruitfulness, no wonder the passage from John ends in that note of joy for you and for us all, the joy of participating fruitfully in the creative and loving energy of God to God's glory. But often, yes, it is a matter for us all simply of standing firm in trouble and persisting in prayer, true in all our lives. God's call to us, as we so often say, is about faithfulness, not success, at least by the measure of our minds. I've talked before in this circuit about my memory of my own trip, like you, Robert, to the Caribbean. And as I stood in the district chairman's manse on Nevis, the old mission house from the 1840s, looking into the garden behind, I saw the sombre grey gravestones of the early missionaries to those islands who fought a battle with the climate and unfamiliar diseases often succumbing so young. And saddest of all, a memorial to one who never even arrived but died on the voyage out there. An unfruitful, failed missionary journey. Yet his life is honoured, his story is still there, even bearing fruit as he becomes part of our story in this circuit and yes, today here at Lidget to remind us of our call to faithfulness. There's another story I've told before, forgive me all those of you who've heard it, but it's lived with me over so many years. I was visiting, well, Florrie Brown, let's call her, an elderly lady at our church, Ladywood as then was, so it's going back a bit. She was feeling depressed at reading the church newsletter, full of glowing tributes to those who died. And she said to me, I've been thinking there won't be anything to say about me when I'm gone. Well, I said what I could. The next week, I went to a dinner for barristers in Lincoln's Inn in London. And my heart sunk when I saw the seating plan. I was put next to a very distinguished lawyer. There was nothing I could think of that we had in common to talk about. Well, it started with him saying, and where do you come from? So I said Leeds, and that was a good start as he was born in Leeds. And then to this day, I don't know how it emerged that I was a Methodist from Ladywood. Not my usual conversation at Lincoln's Inn, I have to confess. How's Florrie Brown, he said. <laughs> in his young days in the youth club, she and her husband had opened their homes every Sunday tea time to those young people I don't know whether the trustees were not so sure about having them on the premises in the chapel. But anyway, that hospitality offered in the name of Jesus still spoke to him long after she'd forgotten. Not forgotten by him or by our Lord. I was like that verse we find in all the Gospels when Jesus has fed the multitude this morning's lectionary. Twelve baskets of the discarded bits of food to be gathered up. Let none of them be lost. Sometimes I wish that gathering up would happen more often in Round A Park. Nothing wasted in the economy of God. I remember preaching in this church once on that great chapter in 1 Corinthians, chapter 15. Paul, in his forensic way, proclaiming at length the truth of the resurrection. And then at the very end of that passage, one of his great therefores. Therefore, my beloved, be steadfast, because you know that in the Lord your labour is not in vain. And I recall dear Reverend George Lovell 
sharing with me afterwards that vision of seeing all his work, the successful and what he regarded as the unsuccessful, in the light of that great truth, the cross of Christ, a failed missionary journey, if ever there was one, transformed by the mighty act of God into resurrection victory, redeeming the whole of creation. Sometimes we are offered that vision of our work. Sometimes it's simply a matter of sticking with it, staying power. I remember reading one day about one of the wonderful embroidered frontals on the altar at York Minster. How was it achieved? By a group of people. I was going to say women, but that might not be true. Each lying on their backs on a mattress underneath the altar frontal and simply pushing the needle through to the front where somebody else would put in the next stitch and send it back through. Not seeing, but in trust that what they offered would be something bringing glory to God. And so turning much more briefly to our reading from Romans, I think people like those embroiderers and Florrie Brown deserved a mention in Paul's list about the gifts given by God's grace to the members of the body. Now Paul's letter to the Romans has long passages in the earlier part where he's talking about the law and righteousness where even as a lawyer I really can't follow what he's on about. But in chapter 12 we have another of his great therefores. Let's get down to brass tacks. You are being transformed by the grace of God. So become what you are, righteous. This is what life, your Christian life, this is what life is all about. Robert and, and Pat, I'm sure you remember that amazing moment at your ordination when the congregation would rightly acclaim that by God's grace, you are worthy. The wonder of God's grace, friends, is that that is what is said to each of us here today. Worthy, but not just as individuals, being connected in love, all playing our part in humility, accepting the gifts God's grace has offered, not just to ourselves, but to the others in the body, building each other up and seeking to do so in peace. No, despite Charles Wesley's hymn, we do not always think and speak the same and cordially agree. However, when Paul says that we're not to conform to this world's values, but be counter-cultural, I believe, friends, that we witness to that best when we seek as the body of Christ to live well with our differences, our contradictory convictions. That's what's really countercultural about the gospel in a society and a world all too ready to resort to cancelling, to racist and sexist trolling, and to cheap sound bites, pandering to adversarial populism by people who should know better. Yes, all. All this is down-to-earth encouragement to the young church in Rome. Value each other, live together in peace, and to us. But last week, I heard a short word offered on this passage by the Archbishop of York, Stephen Cottrell. He told the apocryphal story of a man who died and arrived at the pearly gates and found there were two entrances. One marked heaven and the other for those who want to talk about heaven. This was said at the end of the General Synod of the Church of England, like our meetings, so many words. How many words in meetings have you heard, Robert? But he said, this passage, this picture of the church in Romans 12, offers the very vision of hell, heaven itself, real heaven, begun here on earth, as we live together in the body. No wonder then that Paul urges us to rejoice in that hope. 
I read recently a comment that hope is not just a feeling, that's optimism, but a muscle to be exercised. And perhaps for some of us, exercise becomes harder the older we get. And hope doesn't necessarily get easier either. But perhaps in closing, I can offer myself, and perhaps Robert and Pat, that answer that the famous cellist Pablo Casals gave when, at 95, he was asked why he still practiced several hours every day. Because I think I'm making some progress. That's the hope which we're called to live by joyfully in our own lives, but much more to offer to all those who need to know what life is all about. Not saying that nightclubs aren't part of it, but all that and heaven too. Let's today offer that hope in lives of thankfulness and faithfulness, turning sorrow into song until God brings us home. We sing that hymn that Robert has chosen, Give to me, Lord, a thankful heart, number 520 in Singing the Faith. going now to invite Barbara to come forward um, and to speak on behalf of the circuit. She's one of the circuit stewards. I'm going to invite Robert to come forward as well, if that's all right, Robert, so that uh, we can see you and the people um, online can see you as well, if that's all right with you. And you may have the lecture. This afternoon, I have the privilege of thanking Robert for all the work he has done and the commitment he has given to this circuit. Having watched the circuit service last Sunday, I know that over the 29 years Robert's been here, he's done a variety of roles and had a number of responsibilities, not least of which over the last year, eight years as superintendent of this circuit. Being a superintendent, I'm sure, is not an easy task, and I know there have been lots of challenges. But I hope, Robert, that you have found the work rewarding and that you will have many happy memories to take with you. So thank you, Robert, for all you've done, and Pat for the support you have given. Please accept this gift from the circuit with our best wishes for a happy return.
Thank you very much, Barbara, for those very kind words that you said, and thank you to Tanya and George for leading this service, and thank you to those who've enabled it to happen, so that whether you are here in this place, or somewhere else, or maybe at a different time, you're able to share in this service. Thank you all for being here. It's been difficult to choose who to invite to this service, given the restrictions, but you are all very special people to myself and Pat. There are many other people who are special to us too who will be watching this at home. It is certainly a great wrench to leave Leeds after we've been living here for 29 years. And there have been many experiences here that I have cherished and I will take with me to shape and make the person that I am still becoming. Barbara, as you said, being the superintendent is something that is very challenging in Methodism these days. And it's had increasing challenges as the years has gone on. Methodism works with a um, uh, multi-sided uh, economy, a mixed economy where there's a complexity of different relationships. There are the covenantal relationships that ministers have with one another and the circuit and the connection have with those who are ordained. And I have valued greatly the colleagueship that I have known in this circuit and particularly the strength and colleagueship of the team as it is at the moment uh, I leave it with a great sense of contentment in terms of the dynamics and creativity of that multi-gifted team. There are contractual relationships which have become more important in Methodism now as we increase the number of lay workers. And there's a whole different way of thinking and imagining and working with management committees and contracts. And then there is also the voluntary relationships. Particularly key people like yourselves here at the front, the circuit stewards, who give enormous amount of times to work through the issues that are facing the circuit. And those in the individual churches continuing their life of ministry and witness. Part of the challenge of being the superintendent is to work with that very mixed economy that makes our denomination, the covenantal, the contractual, and the voluntary. Certainly this pandemic has thrown enormous challenges up for us, and as we look forward to this, con this decade, uh, there are tremendous challenges that all of us have to face. Though I'm very relieved that it, in this circuit, it will be others who will be doing that leading. A couple of years ago, um, there was a welcome service here in this church as we welcomed Tanya to be the uh, minister here of this circuit. And we joked about that service being the delete Robert, because I've been the minister of this church for 12 months, and insert Tanya. Well, this is part one of a double service uh, where it is, in terms of the superintendency, delete Robert, and in the welcome service in, uh, in September, it will be insert George and Tanya. My blessing is for the two of you and all the responsibilities and leadership that you will carry, and I know I leave this circuit in very good and safe hands. So my blessing to all of you, and thank you for the 29 years that we've shared together. Thank you, Robert, for those words of encouragement. 
as we move to a time of intercessory prayer, there is a response on the screen. And if you could speak the words in bold. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for this community and for our friends. Help us to work together so that we all flourish together and that your name is made known joyfully. Let the love of God be sung. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for all who support others, the leaders of nations and communities, those in need of justice. Let the love of God be heard. Those who care and those who educate those who serve and those who construct, those in need of hope. Let the love of God be seen. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for those who may feel like the pruned branches those who feel unwanted and unloved. Let the love of God be known. Those who feel themselves to be a burden, those who feel friendless and marginalized, bullied or targeted or left out, let the love of God be shown. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for new shoots, released into life through the pruning of old branches. For babies and for children, for those moving to new lives and new ventures, we pray especially for Robert and Pat and their family as they be begin a new phase of theirs together. For those mourning loved ones and in need of peace, let the love of God be felt. For those passing on from the journey of this life, to new life eternal. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. In the name of Christ, amen. We say together the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. We sing together our closing hymn, number 728 from Singing the Faith. O oh God, you search me and you know me.
May you have time to feel the earth between your toes. May you wander under 2,000 acres of sky. May you find your lungs alive with the wind of creation. And may you know God in each breath, each colour, each step, as you go on your way. Amen. Amen. Let's share together the grace. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and more. Amen.